Today's case is about to get as upsetting and outrageous as a case can get. Nothing in this story makes sense, and the crime is one that shook the victim's families as much as the murderer's family. Austin Haruff was a frat student in Florida in 2016. One day, he went into a couple's home, murdered them with a knife, then the husband's face. When the police came in, he was still chewing and growling at the officers. They had to use dogs and tasers to get him off the body. Now, he says he doesn't remember anything. Is he telling the truth? What exactly happened in his mind on that fateful day? Let's dive in. Austin Harif was born on December 21st, 1996, and grew up with his parents and younger sister Haley in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. His father, Wade, was a dentist and a fairly strict father. Austin remembers he would make him participate in activities he didn't like, such as fishing. He never had a say in things. He was supposed to do what he was told. Austin's mom, Nina, was the opposite of Wade when it came to temperament. She was soft, quiet, and motherly. Austin got on well with both Nina and Haley. In 2013, his parents got divorced, but they had been separated for quite some time, and Austin remembers there was this constant shouting in his home until the divorce finally happened. Austin and Haley stayed with Nina, but over the years, Austin's relationship with his dad got better and better. Eventually, he came to admire his dad, and to pursue a career in dentistry, just like him. Austin wasn't the most popular boy in high school. In fact, he was pretty shy, and that was one of the few things he didn't like about himself, at least according to this high school essay he wrote in January 2014. I view myself as happy because I usually have very few things to feel sad or depressed about. One of the main things I dislike about myself is that I am shy. I want to be more confident and assertive. Austin had also been bullied because he was suffering from acne and was overweight throughout his first year of high school. He'd lost his confidence as a result of this, but he seemed pretty self-aware and wanting to grow and become a better person. In senior year of high school, he became involved in athletics and that helped his confidence and popularity grow. He'd become very fitness ambitious and would post pictures of himself at the gym online. But soon enough, this turned into an obsession. In 2015, he started attending Florida State University, pursuing a major in biology and then switching to exercise science. He wanted to become a dietitian. This is about to become very ironic. At college, Austin joined the Alpha Delta Phi fraternity. He'd always been a social drinker, but with his fraternity, Austin had reached new levels of inebriation. He still suffered from social anxiety and being a freshman and a frat boy pushed him to be drunk 24 seven in an attempt to overcome his shyness. Austin would often drink until he'd black out on campus. He also tried out various at college parties, but he never made a habit out of any except for Instead of becoming more social and more mature, Austin seemed to be doing the opposite. He was behaving erratically and losing friends in the process. Were you aware that you had made a shift in your thinking that was making people uncomfortable? Um, not really. Like, I was aware that something like, I was aware that I became more serious in things, but I wasn't aware that I was pushing people away. In July of 2016, Austin started working as a dental assistant in his dad's clinic. 
Around the same time, Austin had made a vow to stop consuming any substances, including alcohol. This was not the only big lifestyle change he sought. Austin had been raised Presbyterian, but in high school, he had become an atheist. However, as of 2016, he had taken a serious interest in studying various religions. Austin had become fascinated by Christianity, Buddhism, and even the Illuminati. Around the same time, he decided he wanted to become a famous rapper. This may seem funny, but it's also a sign that Austin's mind was just all over the place in the summer of 2016. He was focusing on a thousand things at the same time, but he wasn't really committing to anything. Hello, bros. Uh, it's Austy Frosty, man. Yeah. He called himself Austy Frosty, and he would upload videos of himself singing on YouTube. Or was it singing? Austin had become obsessed with becoming a famous hip hop artist, much like he'd become obsessed with staying fit a few years back. But this time he couldn't sleep. He would lie awake at night, planning his ascension in the music world. However, during that same summer, he became obsessed with another goal. He wanted to become a civil rights leader and help people that no one else can. He was convinced that he would become a huge sensation like Gandhi and solve the problems emphasized by the Black Lives Matter movement. Within a couple of months, Austin went from a party boy who was drunk 24-7 to a very serious young man with big commitments and huge goals. Suddenly, he was so empathetic with people's problems that he would start crying at the dental practice as he was listening to his patients' stories. On August 12, 2016, Austin exchanged some intense texts with his girlfriend. They'd been dating for almost half a year, and his girlfriend was concerned with his rapidly changing behavior. I'm sorry you think I'm so strange now, but I guess I'm following the purpose to my life. It's to give people life, to give people hope. I've been so weird these past days. I sort of lost myself, but I'm back. I feel genuinely good. I'm not sad anymore. Austin believed so hard that he was meant to give people life that he started believing that he was Jesus too. He started wearing light colored clothes, believing that light is good, dark is evil. He soon started hating his own black car for fear that it was evil and driving it would mean he was evil too. Psychologist Todd Grande explains that Austin was suffering from a wide range of mental health issues by then. In the summer of 2016, Austin reported that he began to feel go, 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 and had grandiosity, heightened self-importance, increased religiosity, and paranoia. Austin would only sleep with the lights on, and even so, he would wake up at night convinced that he saw demons in his room. Sometimes he slept in Haley's room on the floor in order to protect her from the demons. He was just as worried about the family dog. In August 2016, he took the dog into his bedroom every night, sleeping with him to protect him from whatever demons he thought lurked outside in the dark. Austin believed he was there to protect his dog as much as his dog was there to protect him. He'd come to believe that he was part dog himself and that the barks he'd hear from his house were trapped souls who wanted to communicate with him. Other times, he thought he was part horse. He was confused, to say the least. These are some of the internet searches Austin did between the end of July and mid-August. How to sell your soul to the devil. What am I crazy really means. How to know if you're going crazy. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Austin would walk into busy roads without looking left and right, his delusions of grandeur were so intense, he was convinced nothing bad could happen to him. On August 13th, Austin collected multiple business cards from people at work or from the street. He thought he could protect them if he had their business cards. Later that day, he decided the exact opposite. Harm would come to those whose business cards were in his possession, so he tore them up and threw them away. On August 13th, 2016, Austin went to dinner with his dad and his dad's girlfriend. He was drinking enormous amounts of water, or 
holy water, as he would say. Justin went to a restaurant. He felt as though God was talking to him, explaining how the water there was the fountain of youth. His dad noticed his son was stressed out and suggested he have an alcoholic drink to relax a bit. Wade suggested this in front of the waiter, who then started pressuring Austin to have a drink as well. Austin did not like this, and he refused to drink alcohol. He'd made a vow to stop all substances at the beginning of the summer, and he wasn't going to start now. At the end of the dinner, Austin offered to drive his dad's girlfriend home, but his dad wouldn't have it. This led to another argument, and it escalated so badly, Wade stole his car keys. After a tense exchange with raised voices, Austin left the restaurant on foot. I don't remember thinking at all. I just, it's like a blur, sort of. <clears throat> so I, I, don't, I don't think I was thinking straight. Austin walked down the main street, waving at passersby and talking to homeless people. Finally, he made it home and slept, or tried to sleep, in his sister's room with the dog nearby. The next day, Austin went for a walk with his dog, and then he started running. The more he ran with the dog beside him, the more he felt like he was a dog himself. He thought he was borrowing strength and agility from the canine species. Later that day, Wade took Austin to a gun show. Bad idea. Austin was even more paranoid than before and was feeling scared by everyone around him. He purchased a switchblade knife and spent most of the day asking sellers how to use this knife in self-defense. On August 15th, Austin visited Wade at his house, and his dad could tell something was off, even more off with him. Not knowing what else to do, Wade offered a Xanax to his son. He thought it might calm him down. But of course, Austin was adamant that he could not take any substances, and he was upset by his dad's offer. He took the Xanax bottle and threw it away. Then he asked his dad for his car keys so that he could drive home. But Wade didn't trust him to do that, so he proceeded to yell and kick things around until his dad gave him the keys, embarrassed by the scene Austin was causing. Austin then drove to one of his frat brother's houses for a party. As you can imagine, everyone was drinking and smoking there, but Austin tried his best to decline the offers. However, at one point he grabbed a bottle of beer and poured it over his hand saying he can absorb the alcohol through his hand. Was this a half measure acting like he still isn't drinking if he doesn't swallow it? Anyway, after the party, Austin headed to dinner with Wade and his girlfriend. But before long, he became agitated and stormed out. He drove back home where he headed straight to the kitchen and guzzled down a big part of a large bottle of cooking oil. His mother Nina saw this and she was at a loss for words. She sat her son down and tried to talk some sense into him. When Austin seemed a bit less anxious, Nina phoned Wade, then drove her son back to the restaurant he and his girlfriend were still at. Soon enough, Austin started another fight with his dad. Wade grabbed his shirt and Austin was ready to punch his dad when he suddenly stopped and stormed out of the restaurant. Once again, he was on foot. A few moments later, a street light went out and in the flickering light, Austin thought he saw an evil presence called Daniel. What went through your mind when you saw Daniel? Um, like when I saw him, it wasn't like a clear person. It was like a dark figure because it was like pitch black outside and I couldn't really see it but I heard his voice distinctly. The voice addressed Austin, and he got very scared and started to run. So you, you, you panicked at that point? Yeah. Did you run? Yeah. Austin ran and ran, scared for his life. But I have a faint memory of taking my pants off at some point. At one point, he started undressing too. He kept running until he saw an open garage door. He ran straight inside and hid from the evil forces he thought were chasing him. There were two people inside the garage, but he didn't see them. He didn't run to them for help. I, I, I don't think I ran up to her. I think I just, I think I just screamed at, and then 
It's a blur. Austin was inside the home of John Stevens and his wife, Michelle Mishkan. John was 59 and Michelle was 53, and the two had been married for a decade. John had worked as a landscaper and Michelle had worked in the finance sector, but both had retired early. They lived in the quiet suburb of Tequesta and spent most of their time on hobbies they'd been putting off for years. This was a relaxed evening and the couple were watching TV in their garage. They would often leave the garage door open so that they could wave to their passing neighbors. It was a tight-knit community and they had many friends down the street. John and Michelle were watching TV when Austin stormed into their garage, screaming frantically about the evil figure chasing him. It all happened so fast and it was so intense, Michelle started to scream as well. She had no idea what was happening and was simply scared for her life. Just was, I just showed up and she was shocked that I was, um, I guess almost naked, but I mean, I, I understand that, but I didn't know, I didn't know I was not clothed properly. Tragically, Michelle's screams are what drove Austin to her to death. Believing she was an evil witch in cahoots with the evil figure chasing him, he pulled out the switchblade he'd just bought the other day and Michelle several times. When John came to help, Austin s***ed him to death as well, this time using a machete he found in the garage. All the while, he was beating him and Michelle with all his strength. There a time during this incident that you realized what was going on? Indeed, Austin had lost all awareness of the present moment, and he couldn't tell what was happening. At one point during the attack, he saw a bottle of liquid in the garage and drank from it, thinking it was alcohol. It was bleach. When you went in that garage, did you drink something in that garage that you found there? I don't want to talk about that. I can't talk about that. Uh -huh. Having heard the horrifying screams, John and Michelle's neighbor, Jeff, ran over to the house to help them. Austin saw him and f***ed him several times. Miraculously, Jeff managed to escape, run home, and dial 911. A medical young man, a woman, Across the street. Neither of them injured. Can you tell from where you are? Yes, there's a girl laying on the ground. He beat her up. I ran over there. I'm bleeding profusely here at the moment. Okay. I don't know what happened. Jeff had been in the back and in his head. He was running on pure adrenaline when he made the call. Just around the same time, Nina called 911 too. She was worried about Austin. Um, yes, I need to... I don't know how to do this. My son, he's um, kind of taken off, and I'm concerned about his own safety. How old is he? Acting a little strange. Um, 19. Nina had no idea what her son had just done or what he was about to do. When the police arrived at the scene, Austin was in his underwear on top of John, his face and chest and growling like a dog. When the police tried to get him off, he growled even harder and hung onto John's body. One police officer tased Austin, but he didn't flinch. While multiple officers kept tasing him, Austin was just pushing the tasers back as if he felt nothing. Officers punched and kicked Austin, and they even sent a police dog onto him. The dog bit Austin, but he just pushed the dog to the side. After several attempts, the police pulled Austin away from the body. As he turned, he spit out a bit of John's face. Austin was bleeding from the dog bites and from the bleach he'd just consumed. Right then, he told a police officer, help me, I ate something bad. When the officer asked him what he ate, he just replied, humans. John and Michelle were pronounced dead at the scene, a scene that left neighbors and even the police in shock. Austin was taken to the hospital, but it wasn't an easy task. 
He was injured, but he was still throwing a fit, attacking anyone who tried to touch him. Austin had shown superhuman strength within the last hour or two. He defended himself from a dog and multiple tasers, as if he was flicking flies off. When the doctors at the hospital learned this, they first assumed he had taken hard. In fact, the only substances found inside Austin's body were alcohol, THC, and the horrible bleach he'd ingested earlier. We were surprised by the results of the blood work. No bath, no f Late this afternoon, the Martin County State Attorney's Office released its toxicology report on Austin Harrow. Because of the bleach, Austin had a burned throat and internal bleeding. His kidneys and liver were failing, and he had blood clots on his brain. The hospital staff thought that Austin would die that night. He was in a coma. But Austin would pull through. And as he recovered, he started to remember what he'd done. He had no idea how bad his crimes were. He didn't even know that he had killed. When the police officers came to arrest Austin, they showed him a picture of the couple he had murdered and When you saw that picture and realized that these were the people that this has happened to, how did you feel? I felt terrible and I really, really don't have words to explain how I feel. It's like, it's like a nightmare. As days progressed and Austin received treatment inside the hospital, he became increasingly remorseful about his crimes. He simply couldn't come to terms with becoming a I never imagined that this would ever happen. And I'm deeply sorry to the family that was affected. And I hope that Something like this never happens again. When Dr. Phil prompted Austin to address the family, he broke down in tears. <laughs> I never wanted to Two months after the murder, Austin had made a decent enough recovery to be taken into arrest. He was charged with the murder of John and Michelle and with the attempted murder of Jeff. Fisher. While he awaited the trial, Austin went through several psychiatric evaluations to determine what exactly caused such a psychotic episode and such strange behavior over the last few months. Bottom line, he suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This meant that Austin would be considered insane at the time of the murder. But psychiatrists had to determine whether Austin was telling the truth or he was malingering, that is, faking the symptoms. While Austin was undergoing many tests, his family was brought in for questioning as well. Nina was in visible shock, suffering from the reality of her son. She knew something was wrong with him. She dialed 911 the very evening of the attack. She'd seen his mental health decline over the summer, and her son had always had mental health illnesses, ever since he was a kid. Austin had crippling social anxiety throughout his childhood and teenage years, and he suffered from sleep paralysis too. He'd also struggled with depression for most of his teenage years, and he said that 60% of the time, he had zero reason to feel depressed. However, leading in the weeks to the murder, Austin didn't feel depressed at all. On the contrary, he felt fresh, motivated by his desire to help people. But he was sleeping just a couple of hours a night, and his schizophrenia was getting out of hand. Perhaps the strangest thing in this story is that there was no situational stressor to trigger Austin's fast decline. He had a fairly stable life at home, a good relationship with his mom and sister, and a good enough relationship with his dad. There were no big events in Austin's life except perhaps getting his first job in 2016. No fights, no breakups, no deaths in the family nothing of great significance. An even sadder angle is that that summer, Haley offered to take Austin to therapy with her and he'd accepted. He was on the path to mental recovery or at least he was accepting his family's help. Unfortunately, his decline simply happened too fast. His family could never have predicted 
what Austin would end up doing. And this wasn't something that just happened one night. This was something that's gone on with you for a period of time. Yeah, I guess so. And should the courts decide that you were in need of, of treatment, that would be something that you would lean into. You, you recognize that you, you need help and treatment, correct? Yes. Dr. Phil worked together with Austin's dad to make sure he got the proper diagnosis and treatment. However, when this interview was released, it stirred up a lot of emotion in the local community, especially when it came to John and Michelle's neighbors. We used to uh, keep the doors open at night and now, I mean, it's, it's no more of that. The neighbors were upset that Dr. Phil's interview puts Austin in too good a light, almost acquitting him of the gruesome murders he committed. But the interview provided valuable evidence for the jury, and releasing it to the public was just a calculated step into the lengthy process of Austin's trial. When all the psychiatric tests concluded, it was agreed that Austin did indeed suffer from an acute psychotic episode and did not fake symptoms of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. The Palm Beach County man accused of killing a couple in a gruesome face biting attack was legally insane at the time. That is according to a forensic psychological exam. This is one of the things Austin recalled from the day of the attack. Mr. Harroff recalls putting on a Michael Vick jersey, which he believed the dog spirits told me to put on and in doing so felt invincible. It was clear Austin could not be tried as a sane person for the murder of John Stevens and Michelle Mish Khan. But Austin's trial kept getting delayed because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As of early 2022, it keeps getting because of a variety of reasons. In March 2022, Austin's lawyers said that they may seek a non-jury trial. The judge indicated this might mean the trial won't happen until late summer or fall 2022. But the prosecution is pressing for a conclusion. This case needs to come to a resolution. It's a 2016 case, 2016, and it's 2022. There's absolutely no reason why this case should have taken this long so far. The prosecution is also attacking the psychiatric evaluations Austin went through, and they are trying to prove that he was not insane at the time of the murders. It's a long time before justice can be brought for John and Michelle. Maybe justice will never be brought for them. Austin was in a horrific state of mind in 2016, and he can never truly come to terms with what he did. However, his apologies will never heal the wounds of the couple's families. This is a thought that shocks even those who never knew John or Michelle. No amount of time in prison or psychiatric facility for that matter will help bring closure to the people affected by Austin's crimes. And just as much, Austin's family will never be the same again. Knowing your son or brother went from a shy fraternity college student to a manic with zero memory of the event is deeply traumatizing. The Haroff family will have to live with this and try to forgive Austin for what he became. Hopefully with the right amount of treatment, Austin will get better and learn to accept himself and his actions. This is the only thing he can do now. Thanks for watching. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and why not subscribe to our channel for more. Until next time and stay safe.